Hello everybody, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&A. Remember these questions are from people that have followed the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. If you want to find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you can go to biggameindicatingdogs.com and you can follow Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. And you can follow my own stuff at Paul John Michaels at Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. Let's get into these questions. The first question here is from Justin. Hi Paul, I have a six month old pointer cross with heading dog. So it's a six month old pointer crossed with a heading dog trying to heading dog pointer cross. Trying to introduce her to inside for 10 minutes. That's p- part of the blueprint. At once we get to a certain point, um, we start bringing the pup inside. The deer dog training blueprint, we start kenneling the pup outside right from the start. Um, this is the best. This really is the best, this real separation from the start. Uh, it just gets more focus out of the pup. Training's better, training's easier. Uh, it's all about the way a pup or a dog prioritises activities. Um, it just really is. If you keep that pup separate right from the start and you kennel it outside, you kennel it in a quiet area, the the time you're spending with it is only training in nice, calm, quiet scenarios. You get more focus and learning and drive out of the dog. It really does. That full-on blueprint system, deer dog blueprint system of kenneling a pup outside right from the start, it creates a different thing, man. It really does. And later on, as we get more... Uh, structure with the pup, more age and training and things start to come together. Then we start bringing the pup or dog inside. Now my dog's live in print, the dog that I trained in the deer dog training blueprint. By the time he's 15 or 18 months old, he lives inside full time now, sleeps. He actually sleeps on the floor right next to my bed. Uh, Miko sleeps on a on a her big folded up blanket in the lounge. like They live the life of luxury, but starting them off separated like that, and following that principle of freedom and responsibility, our dogs get more freedom and responsibility as they get ready for it. Um, man, it it's it's huge. I sort of touched on this in the last Q and A. Um, just it's it's. Um, I use that weird analogy of 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 the MMA fighter Khabib. I sort of thought about that after the Q and A. I was like, oh, that was a bit of a weird analogy at the moment. But um, uh, it it honestly is. It's a huge one, man. That that separation and that focus and that having your pup or dog live that quiet, structured life particularly over that first six months and definitely over that first 12 to 18 months and as we train them, as we build the bond, as we build the control, they just slowly get more and more freedom and responsibility as they get ready for it. It it just builds and creates a different thing. I can't, it's something that I've been thinking about more and more lately, you know. Um, It's huge, It's, it's quite a, a full-on topic, um, but it is huge, and, and we talk about it a lot in the blueprint, uh, particular as you know, including early on in the blueprint, we talk about how the way a pup or a dog prioritizes activities, um, and when you keep it all calm and quiet and structured like that, and a, if you kennel a pup outside on its own, separate from the household, um. When it sits quietly in a kennel on its own outside like that and then you go out and let it out of the kennel, put a long line on it and train it, training such a high priority activity that the pup's so interested and engaged in, you just get so much bang for your buck. It's just so productive versus if a pup's been living inside, rolling around in front of the TV, climbing all over kids, walking around the the house, climbing on the couch, sniffing around the kitchen, and then you take it outside into the cold and the wet grass and put a long line on it and tell it to sit, it's just not interested, man. That's the difference. It's And it's just, it, that whole thing there is huge. It really is. 
Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to give that for context for people that are listening that haven't followed the blueprint and, and Justin's talking about kenneling his puppy outside. Um, well, he's talking about having issues bringing his six-month-old pup inside because that's where he's starting off at that his pup's about six months old and we start doing that in the blueprint. We start bringing the pup inside. Once we've actually got a sit and a stop and a little bit of control and structure, that's when we bring the pup inside and we start bringing it inside at the right time and sitting it down next to us, introducing it to inside in a calm and structured way and we slowly build that over the dog's life. If people, and this actually come up in the inner circle, the big game indicating dogs inner circle, it's a closed Facebook group that anyone that's following the Dear Dog Training Blueprint goes into and it's a support group. Um, <clears throat> I saw it come up in there recently, people talking about um, having, about it being really cold, being the puppy being really cold outside. You know, coming into winter here in New Zealand and it's going to be getting really cold and they had a, um, down in the South Island, it's going to be getting really cold soon. You know, you're talking minus 10 degrees Celsius um, in the deep, deep south on a really cold night. That is freaking cold. And uh, it was really good in the inner circle. People were talking about all of the solutions that they've used um, you know, really warm dog jackets, insulating the kennel, using really good bedding and all of that. And there's people that have done that with breeds like GSPs and Vizslas right from a pup. They live outside. Even people that have a lot of dogs um, and it's they can't bring all their dogs inside, so they, they have to kennel them outside. People that are renting, there's a lot of people that, that – uh, don't own the house that they live in and they're literally not allowed to bring the dog inside. There's all of these different situations. You can kennel a pup outside right from the start if you have to. Um, I think being able to do that is incredibly constructive towards training, the whole thing I was just talking about, the, the creating that contrast and making training a high-priority prior, activity giving that pup that calm, quiet, structured start to life. Um, but you can create the pup inside too, particularly if you're sensible about it. The Palmico Dog Guide is another dog training video series that we have. Um, that goes through a very structured process of crating inside. If you've already got the blueprint, we can add, you can add Palmico for you know hugely discounted price. Um, but the Palmico dog guide has that inside crating system that you can combine with the blueprint. So if you really want to crate your pup inside for whatever reason, you can do it. Um, I still think being outside and the more calm and removed a situation the pup is in. I think that's beneficial for all those reasons I talked about in the last podcast and the start of this. Um, but just giving a bit of bit of um, background here on this. So Justin's obviously had his pup outside, <clears throat> killing his pup outside right from the start. And he's saying he's starting to introduce his pup to inside, which is... Uh, it's in all in the blueprint and some of the in, in the steps that we go through and training in the blueprint you start bringing your pup inside we do it all in a structured way it's all in there demonstrated and explained uh, but Justin's finding it he's trying to bring his pup inside and he said it's impossible to get her to calm down inside she seems to go nuts she tries to latch on to me. It just turns into a battle, so I've just stopped trying to bring her in. Any ideas to calm her down in this situation? So my notes on this is this is just an overall control and relationship thing. She's obviously a really full-on dog. Practice kneeling more and stopping more outside and time and patience. So... 
it really is just an overall control and relationship thing. If you, you know, the whole idea in doing it later on in the blueprint is to avoid that whole phase where we're bringing a pup inside and the pup is off lead out of the crate inside and just running amok, you know, and you can't tell it to sit or get down or do anything because it doesn't even have those commands yet. And if we come right back to our principles of real dog training that, that we go over in the blueprint, uh, any time you give a you give a dog a command that it has the opportunity to not listen to is training the dog that it doesn't have to listen to you. And if you start reverse engineering a dog training system, keeping all of those principles in mind right from the start, you end up with the blueprint. But that's what it is. That's why we kennel the pup right from the start. We use a long line right from the start. That's why we do everything in the order. We do all of these these step-by-step processes, everything done correctly in the right order. It's all reverse engineered. And, you know, this is a huge part of why all of that control and structure works so well and creates a completely different dog is you're avoiding all of these massive pitfalls that people get into. And, And once you go down that route, you can't, wind back time and erase the fact that it happened. Every time you give a pup or a dog a command that it has the opportunity to not listen to, you are training that pup or dog that it doesn't have to listen to you. Another one of our principles, exposing weakness. You're exposing weakness. If you bring a pup, or dog inside that isn't that doesn't have a sit command, it doesn't, it has no manners at all. You have no tools in place to tell it to sit, stay. You don't even have that bond and relationship and structure and respect. You have nothing set up and you bring it inside in that exciting environment with the TV going and people walking around and you sit down on the floor and it just doesn't, it's just overload for the pup and you have no tools to control it and it just ends up in chaos and that chaos bleeds into everything else that you try to do with that pup outside of that including training and hunting or whatever the job is that you want to do with your pup or dog. So that's why that all of that is so important. It really freaking is. You know, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about that there's so much in that. That separation and structure and kenneling and crating and all of that early on. Like, and there's no way around that because that's the issue you're dealing with. You're putting a pup in a situation that you don't even have the tools to manage it yet. And it's just a recipe. You're just shooting yourself in the foot. You're just screwing yourself over big time. So back to Justin's question. Um, It's just an overall control and relationship thing. She's obviously a full-on dog or there's some issues with your training and your management and everything else here. Um, Basically, she's not ready to come inside yet. She's not. So... If if you're if you you're bringing her inside, and what we do in the blueprint is we actually sit down on the ground, on the floor in your lounge. I'm pretty sure in the blueprint, almost a hundred percent sure I'm sitting on the floor. Like instead of sitting up on the couch and trying to get my get print to sit on the on the floor in front of me, I actually sit on the floor next to him, and do a stop drill. Sit, print, sit, and I get him to sit down next to me. And we just sit for like 10 minutes and we just run through all of the normal stuff that we do in a stop draw. If the dog gets up off the stop, I just put him back down. Ah, sit, sit him back down. As soon as he's sitting, give him a pat, good boy. And I read a magazine and I just sit there and read a magazine. 
I don't have the TV on. I don't have people walking around. I don't have all this noise and distraction and stimulation. I'm literally winding it right back to the easiest scenario. And that's why I sit on the floor instead of on the couch. Because if I'm up on the couch, Prince going to be thinking about me and wanting to sit up and look to me. And I actually get down on the floor to make it easier for him. I'm sitting right next to him. And later on, one of our steps in training is next, next time I actually sit up on the couch or a couple of sessions later. And then later on, I turn the TV on. And then I move a little bit further away from him. And then once I think he's ready for it, I get up and walk over to the kitchen, get a glass of water, come back and sit back down. And I slowly add more and more and more training and steps. It's another one of our principles. Until I can just bring him inside, say, Prince sit, and he just sits, and I can just go about my life and everything's chill. Now he lives inside the whole time. He has since he was about 18 months old, and he had it all sorted. Um, so if you're in a situation where you're trying to bring a pup inside and you're trying to sit down and run a stop drill and it's just, what do you say, um, seems to make her go nuts and she tries to latch on to me and it just turns into a battle, she's not, you're not, you need, you've got more work to do outside before you bring her in. In the last Q&A podcast, the Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&A podcast, I talked about um, like patience and, and every dog, some dogs take much longer than others. And, and you've got to be really careful that you're doing everything properly and you're doing enough of it and you're not doing a bunch of other stuff that's screwing up and undoing the good stuff that you are doing. Like you've got to do everything properly. If you're doing everything properly to a T and, you, and you're not getting there, then it's just more time. And some dogs do take more time. They really do. Um, so it's just a time thing. Um, having said that, though, I've never worked with a pup or dog that I couldn't get. If I did everything correctly up to six months old, I've never worked with a pup or dog that I couldn't get sitting next to me inside on the floor with no other distractions and me just sitting there quietly. That's quite extreme. You know, if you have done everything properly up to that point, everything's working correctly outside, everything else is up to spec, and I bring that pup inside and it just turns into this completely different animal. Uh, yeah. Something seems a little bit off there for me. But nonetheless, if you are in this situation and you're trying to bring your pup inside, she's six months old and she's just going nuts and you, you can't even do that constructive, just sit quietly for 10 minutes with no other distractions inside, <clears throat> you've just got to go back, take steps back, go back and double check all your other stuff. You know how in the blueprint, as we get to about part three or four, before I start going over all of the new stuff that we're going to be working on in the new part that you're just starting to watch, I do the, the update. And it's it's almost to the point of being a little bit ridiculous and annoying, but it has to be there. What the update is, is saying, okay, before we start working and you start working on all of the stuff we're going to work in this part of the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you need all of this stuff first. And I go over all of the things Prince's already doing. And, and I do that. That gets changed for every episode of the Blueprint as we go through. On the earlier parts, I'm to, I, I tell you, okay, Prince now walking nicely out in front on the long line. He's doing a stop, stop drill like this. Uh, we haven't, you know, we haven't done the introduction of gunfire yet, so we're not doing that. He's doing the basic skin drags. He's coming inside for 10 minutes. He's doing, this is all of the things Prince doing, this, 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 and this. Make sure your pup or dog 
is doing all of that like that before you move on to the stuff. So if if you are where you're at with that six-month-old dog and you can't even bring it inside and it's just going nuts inside trying to do that stop, you've got to go back and work on all that other basic stuff and make sure it's like super tidy, like real good. If you can't do your basic stuff outside, you're not ready to move in and do it inside. Um and if you can do all of that stuff outside, but you can't do what you're trying to do inside, again, it doesn't, that doesn't really make sense to me. It seems like something's a little bit off there. But if you are somehow in a really unusual situation like that, but that's this note here. Practice kneeling more and stopping more outside. So I can somehow imagine a situation where you're doing very structured, everything's very structured, the pup's been kenneled outside, you're doing your stop, go, turn, when you do your stop drills, you just go sit, get the dog sitting, step back, move around, step back in, pat it, step back, release, and you're doing everything very robotic like that, and then bringing the pup inside and you sitting down on the floor next to it, that's the first time that pup's experienced anything like that, and it's just like, whoa, having a big excited overload of, whoa, something's different. Something different is happening here. And it's just like spazzing out. If that's what's happening, I would do more outside, even outside of the stop drill, just when you're walking with your pup in between drills, I would just stop and kneel down. And, and if the pup turns around and sees you kneeling, it will come barreling in. That's what it, if, if it doesn't, there's something wrong. Like if you getting down at the pup's level should just be an open invite for it to come in. If it's not, call it in and practice interacting with it at its level. I mean at its physical level, so you're getting down, kneeling down. And if it comes flying in and it's biting your hand and trying to climb on you, just up, push it down, up, push it down. If it keeps trying to do it, push it down and move on. And then keep practicing that. Pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. So if it keeps coming in and jumping up and trying to bite your hand and being silly, always cut that off with pressure, up and push it back. And as you get these little split-second moments to pat it, eventually you'll get a moment somewhere where you are down at the pup's level and it pauses for like three seconds. I don't care if it gets distracted by a leaf getting blown across the, the field next to it and you get three seconds to go, good pup. And you pat it for three seconds and then the leaf goes past and the pup switches back to you, starts biting you again, then go, ah, and move on. And just keep rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. My final note on this, time and patience. Pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. Keep practicing getting down at the pup's level. Every time it bites or jumps up or bangs into you and it's just like over the top, put pressure on it, push it away, disengage, cut it off. Every time you get a half second, two second, three second to say good pup, do that. And that that example of like a leaf blow, I've worked with dogs a lot where in the first week or so, like everything's so freaking chaotic and out of shape, it is. It's just so messy and it's just like banging your head against a wall and, and it feels very ineffective and impossible and you're literally like choosing those moments when the dog gets distracted and it's looking off to the side and you're like good pup good pup. and then it realizes and it turns back and it climbs all over and you push it down and you just walk away and and you just have to that's honestly what it's like and if you do everything perfectly consistently for long enough you'll start making progress 
you will. And you'll start to get more and more opportunities to praise the pup or dog while it's doing the right thing. Always put pressure and disengage with the wrong thing and you'll make progress. You have to do everything right. You can't do you can't do everything right and then do a bunch of stuff out to the side of that that screws up all of the right stuff that you're doing. And then you just need to make sure you're doing everything properly in time and patience and rinse and repeat. And if you don't make good progress doing that, you're dealing with a real extreme outlying anomaly. <clears throat> um, let, let us know. Keep us posted on that. Like, Let us know how you're getting on. Uh, just sorry, just having a drink there. <clears throat> uh, Georgie. Hey, Paul, we've got an eight-month-old GSP that has gotten a few of our chickens and unfortunately killed them. We're keeping them completely separated at the moment. Is there a way we can introduce them and train him to train him not to chase them down and treat them like a chew toy? <laughs> uh I've got a lot of notes on this. First note is very difficult, unsupervised. If you're talking about when you say, you know, we've, we're have we keeping them completely separated at the moment, is there a way we can introduce them to them and train them not to chase them down and treat them like a chew toy? Basically train them not to chase them down and kill them. My, my notes on that is my initial notes on this, again, I've got a lot of notes here, uh, that's very difficult, i.e. impossible to do while the dog's unsupervised. It's a dog that's been bred for hundreds of years to kill, to, to hunt birds. A G, GSP can be, a, can they can be pretty hot. Uh, if you're talking about and, and you at the moment you're dealing with an eight month old GSP. We're keeping them separate. Introduce him. You're talking about an eight month old male GSP. That's like there's a couple there's a couple of dogs that are a drathar is probably a, is arguably hotter than that. When I say hot, I mean like a a dog with a propensity to want to kill a bird and like uncontrollably want to kill a bird, an eight-month-old male GSP, you, you're almost dealing with like one of the strongest examples of a, of a dog that if it's in the same space as a bird, because eight-month-old, that's not, that's not fully trained no matter what you've done. We've had plenty of people that have been starting to hunt a pup carefully on the blueprint. They've pushed it through the blueprint faster. They've got the right pup. They've done an exceptional job and they've started, and the dogs, they've done all their scent work and they've got it introduced to gunfire and, it's, and they started hunting and started shooting deer with an eight-month-old uh, uh, Vizsla. I don't actually know of a GSP off the top of my head that started successfully that early. We've had people do it with Vizslas. Heading dogs. I've done it with heading dogs in the past, um, but you're talking about leaving an eight-month-old GSP uh, off leash in an area with a chicken. <laughs> uh, I would be irresponsible if I told you that there was any way of setting of, of having that dog set up in a way that would guarantee that that dog isn't going to kill that chicken. There's no way you can do that. That's and that's supervised. You know, you're talking off leash, like free in the same space. That putting a Eight-month-old GSP, I don't care how, what you've done with it, off-leash in the same space as a chicken is setting that dog up to fail big time. And there's nothing that you can do 
to guarantee that that's not, that isn't going to go sideways on you, that that dog ain't going to kill that chicken. <clears throat> Again, it's a dog that's been bred for hundreds of years to kill birds. Um, not necessarily kill them, maybe it's supposed to point them, maybe it's supposed to retrieve them, uh, but it's definitely trained to hunt them and it's definitely trained to kill stuff. You know, those those versatile German dogs, they are also bred to run out after wounded game and grab it and drag it down and stuff. They're hot. That's what I mean by hot. Um, you try sending a Vizsla or a, or a um, really strong-eyed, dainty heading dog, try sending that in on a pig or a... Um, you know, even a wounded deer for that matter, they're, they're not going to run in full blast like a pit bull will and just run it at full speed and just latch on like just crazy hit it head on. They, they'll stop back and they'll want to maybe bark at it. They'll probably might set up and point at it from a distance and sl- like they don't, they don't have that. Like a lot of vizslers don't, strong-eyed heading dogs don't. Uh, a GSP does. They are the sort of dog that'll just run head on into something and just hit it at full speed and just want to sink teeth. They can be hard, man. That's what I mean by hot. Um... It's a dog that's been bred for hundreds of years to do what you're asking me how to stop it, how to get it to stop doing it. Um, More notes. The part in part one when I introduce print to fly, introduction to cows, and also non target species aversion training is how you would train the dog to be able to have it around chickens later on under supervision and be able to control it off leash. And you should 100% be able to get that dog to that point in time. Um, 100%, you know... um, Once it's fully trained. But that's, particularly with a GSP, um, that's quite, that's arguably one of the highest end uh, parts of control is to be able to, you have a, you have a, bird breaking out of cover you and a chicken's the worst man because it's on the ground it's just it's a bird and it, it uh, some chickens can fly a lot of them don't fly that well a lot of them times they're just running around on the ground and stuff um like a, a chicken running around in front of a gsp and being able to that dog lines that chicken up and goes to break and been able to go ah or sit and the dog just sits that's that's a fairly high level of control. 100% you can do that, and you should be able to. What I'm saying is, is if you're talking about unsupervised, really, really difficult. And if you're talking about putting a young dog in that position before it's gone through all of the high-level, high-end, later on in the blueprint steps of training... You're, you're just setting it up to fail. Um, as far as how you would train a dog to do that, that's to have that level of control, that's basically what, other than all the scent training and introduction of gunfire and obstacles and all the other stuff, that's basically the deer dog training blueprint, is, is that's what it's all geared towards, is to get that type of level of control. And that's what it does do. And that's basically what you're doing the whole way through the series 
is leading up to the point where you have that type of control. That's why we do all of the long line stuff. Everything's on a long line. Everything's controlled and structured. Everything's set up so the dog never has that opportunity to not listen to a command. You never give the dog a command that it has the opportunity to not listen to. So everything just becomes automatically. The dog doesn't even know how to not listen. doesn't even know that it can not listen. That's the ideal scenario. And... So that's all your long line training. That's the automatic stop, the range, the stop, the increasing distraction on the stop. Uh, a huge, huge parts in this, it, like right from part one, I show you how I introduce print to fly as a pup and I do it on the long line with fly at a distance and I'm holding the long line and if print wasn't on the long line, he'd just go running up to fly, but I have him on a long line and I show you how I slow him down and hold him back and control him on the long line. Introduction to cows is similar. That's later on in the blueprint. There's some really good principles there on how to introduce a pup or a dog to an animal and do it all in a controlled and structured way. And the reason why we do it later on is because we... It's the same as bringing a pup or dog inside as we don't do it until we have the tools that we need to manage that situation properly. That's why we do introduction to cows later. And a really big one here is non-target species aversion training. Later on in the blueprint. And I in the blueprint I do it with possums and rabbits because that's our most... One of our, two of our most common, if not the most common non-target species that we have issues here with in New Zealand with deer dogs is possums and rabbits. And, and I show you the whole process of that and break down all of the principles behind that non-target species aversion training. Basically training a dog that, hey, we're not interested in that. That's all in there in the blueprint. But those three parts in particular... Introducing print to fly, introduction to cows and non-target species aversion training, that's all that. Um, so it's kind of all in there, you know. And, and you're saying we're keeping them completely separated for the moment. Is there a way we can introduce him to them and train him not to chase them down and, and treat them like a chew toy? Train him, him not to chase them down and kill them? A hundred thousand percent there is a way that you can train him not to chase them down and kill them while you are there. There's zero ways of training him to not chase them down and kill them while you're not there. Zero. So as far as 100% for me to responsibly say, uh, Georgie, do this, this, this and this and that dog is never going to kill one of those chickens while you're not there, I would be a bullshitter if I tried to tell you that there was a way that you could train a GSP to guarantee that it's not going to kill a chicken while no one's there. There's no way of doing that. Uh, you could go down the e-collar route and basically do what they do in uh, Kiwi aversion training. I wouldn't recommend it. That's a whole, that's a huge whole other subject. Um, it could that could affect if you wanted to use the dog that dog for birds as well. That could affect that. Could affect the dog's drive towards birds. Um, it could give you issues around the retrieve and it could be a negative thing. And it still doesn't 100% guarantee it, particularly if he's already killed chickens because you've already, remember, you know, another principle from the blueprint, one moment can count forever. That's a biggie, man. Like a, a, putting a GSP pup in a situation where it kills a chicken that's a big moment. You can't erase that. That dog knows that it can do it, that it's fun, that it, it didn't 
the chicken didn't electrocute it last time. So you could elect, you could do your e collar training. You could do tons of stuff, and you can momentarily fix it. There's stuff you could do, and you could say, "See, he's not doing it now." So what I did worked, but like a hundred percent guarantee, no. So it all comes back to the same stuff. Proper training, following the system properly, everything is in there. You can definitely get basically any dog to the point where you can control it around extreme distractions while you are there. Uh, there's very little you can do to guarantee a dog won't do something like that while no one's there. That's why kenneling is so important. Uh, management, supervision. <laughs> One Another note here, if you leave a GSP unsupervised where he can get to chickens, he's probably going to kill chickens. <laughs> and that's that's what it boils down to. If you train right for long enough, you can do it. I mean, supervised. Uh, here's another note. Miko and chasing and how she's good now off leash when I'm around. So Miko is the Vizsla heading dog cross that I trained in the Palmiko dog guide. Uh, and I spoke, talked about her in the last Q&A. She went through a phase where I'd basically done everything did everything that was in the blueprint. Uh, well, no, actually, that's not even that's not even remotely true. Uh, the Palmico dog guide was was very structured. A lot of the same principles out of the blueprint, but uh, to nowhere near of the level that we train in the blueprint. The Palmico Dog Guide is our general dog training video series that's on how to train, just have a well-trained pet. But we did use a long line. We did do a lot of uh, crating and kenneling and a lot of training. And But nowhere near to the extent that we do in the Deer Dog Training Blueprint with all of the automatic stops and um, increasing distraction on the stop. And it's the, the Deer Dog Training Blueprint goes way so much more so much further in that respect of control and and it's got all of those other elements of you know Miko was inside right from a pup and she had more freedom and less structure I bet if I had to put Miko through the blueprint instead of the pal Miko dog guide I bet she would have been far closer if not all the way there to being ready to be off-leash around distraction uh, far earlier than she was with that more relaxed system of the Palmico dog guide. Um, but Miko went through a phase where I'd done a lot with her. I thought she would be ready to be off-leash around distraction like like that, like chickens, birds, seagulls, pukikos in the parks around town here. Um, but she just freaking wasn't yet. And I had two major incidents with her. Um, one was an incident where I was in the early stages of letting her off the long line. And she was looking good, looking fine, everything was sweet. And then one day on the beach, she just lined up the seagull. I'm trying to remember how old she was at this point. Probably 12 or 14 months old, somewhere around there. We'd done you know, all of that time of training with her. She had a stop, go, come. She was all house trained. Um, she had a lot. She had a lot. She really did. And she had a lot of time on the long line and a lot of drills. Um, good recall, all of that but it wasn't good enough yet. And I had her off leash at the beach and I was a little bit too chill. I was giving her a little bit too much free reign, a little bit too much freedom. Before She was obviously wasn't ready for it. She lined up the seagull. I saw her doing it. I said, Miko, Miko, come. And she just switched her ears off and went. 
and chase the seagull. And it was just that classic scenario. We're like, Miko! Me! And you're like, yep, you're like that dude yelling at your dog and your dog's just ears are off and she's, and she's just chasing the seagull like 300 metres up the beach. And I'm running after her, yeah, running after my dog, uh, yelling my dog's name. Like, um, what's that? What's that really famous meme? Um, like Fenton, or it's actually Benton. Benton, Benton, the English guy that's chasing his dog through that park, and the dog's chasing like a hundred deer across a motorway. And he's like, "Oh my God, Benton!" I was like that, running up the beach, Miko, and I'm a dog trainer, you know. And uh, got her back and thought, okay, I'm going to have to be, and, and I followed my own training principles, took a step back. She was back on the long line for a long time. I just put her, she was back on the long line. And I had another incident. This all happened within it. It was probably about, I did another six or eight months where I was real careful. So she, she went from being about 12 months to about 18 or 20 months old before she was ready for that extreme distraction. I'm talking like a rabbit running across in front of it, a, a, a seagull. And you know seagulls, th this seagull, it got up and it flew like about a foot off the ground and for whatever reason it didn't want to get right up high or fly off to the side or anything. It flew like right on the high tide line, right on the firm sand, right where we walk up and down the beach like almost every day, right when Miko knew she was about to go, the seagull just got up and flew about a foot off the ground, just straight up the beach. It was just like someone throwing a frisbee that just never stopped flying. You know, It was just as far as a, a thing for Miko to chase, it was just that perfect scenario. And, um, and she went for it. Uh... So I went back, she was always on the long line again, long, 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 long line, and I just went back to doing our walks on the long line, doing stop drills. Um, I stopped putting her in that situation where I was setting her up to fail and just carried on like that, carried on like that. And um, two or three months later, I was out at my mum's place and, and what I was doing was doing that, but then also having her off the long line sometimes. I wasn't, I didn't go right back to the point of like long line going on before she comes out of the kennel type thing. Around the house, she was out of the kennel off the long line. Um, and I was being too lax with her too. I really was. I'd finished filming most of the Palmico dog. I'd basically finished it at that stage. And... You know, I wasn't filming the blueprint. The whole idea of the Palmico dog guy was to be more relaxed. And and I had a ton of other stuff going on too. And so I was just a little, little bit sloppy. I really was. And I paid for it. And it just shows. And this is like when I go on my talks about how important that structure from the blueprint is and how it creates a different thing how what print is and, and what he was turning out to be as we went was it just a totally different thing to a system that was a little bit more relaxed than that. That's like what I've done with Miko, how it's driven home, how important all of that stuff in the blueprint is. It's just like it's reminded me what I already knew. You know, I almost started to forget some of what I already knew. Uh, anyway, so we had that thing with the with the um, seagull up the beach, and then I was being careful with her. Two or three months later, hadn't had a slip up for a while, and I was out at my mum's place, and I can't remember exactly what happened. I think I was just doing something on the back lawn. I just turned up and I'd, I'd let the dogs out and we were going to go inside and you, the dogs come inside at mum's place too. Um, I've got kennels there. Sometimes I just put the give the dogs a quick walk in the paddock. Um, it's a closed-off paddock. There's usually not heaps of game running around there and stuff. So they, 
They basically had freedom sessions at mum's place in the paddock there, um, off-leash freedom sessions. I can't remember exactly what I was doing, where I was going, what I was going to do next, but I, I arrived at mum's place out in the country. I'd let the dogs out of the kennel. I was going about to give them a walk or put them in the kennel or take them inside or do something. Um, I'd never just leave them outside unsupervised, just free while I go inside. Never do that. Even now with print, I just that's just the recipe to get a dog run over or something silly like that. Um, but I'm there outside. The dogs are off leash. So I'm doing something for a moment and I turn around and I'm like, where's Miko? And she's boosting across the paddock chasing a pukiko and basically doing the exact same thing that she did with that seagull except the Pukeko was a worse flyer than the seagull and she chased it for about 200 metres and the, the Pukeko sort of lost steam and went down in this real long grass and into the drain and Miko caught it. So basically worst case scenario, exactly what I was telling uh, Georgie, um, you know, now that your GSP's killed chickens, you can't erase the fact that that's happened. And, and the GSP's hot. So that happened with Miko. So she'd broken and chased birds twice, and the second time she did it, she actually caught the bird and killed it. <clears throat> you know, pretty, pretty, that's like one of those moments that can count forever. Pretty worst case scenario type setup. Um, so I just like, I was pissed at myself. Um, <clears throat> And I just went, okay, I've got to be even more freaking careful. So I was. And I just went back to all of the training principles, all of the stuff that's it's all in the blueprint and in and, and even more detail and to an even higher level than, than what's in the Palmico Dog Guide. But all of the same pr principles and everything is in the Palmico Dog Guide too. All of the tools, the long line, control, stop, go, come, recall, everything's all there. It's just all in a different uh, order. We've got all the crating stuff from uh, starting right from a pup crating inside, but it's just everything's there in a different order and basically to a lower level. It's just more chill. And um, so I just went back to all of my same stuff, all, all everything that's in my series and everything that I talk about in these Q&As and all of that. Structure, control, long line, not setting the dog up to fail, and just keep going. And um, taking her for walks in the long line, um, making sure I didn't make mistakes like that day so she could run off and chase the pukiko and kill it in the grass and stuff. Never set her up to fail. And another few months on, she started getting better. And then um, I started picking my times to let her off the long line when I thought there was no distractions around, kept doing everything correctly, made sure I wasn't doing a bunch of stuff to screw it up, kept doing my training, kept working on my range, long line, stop drills, more control, the dog's getting older. And then eventually one day, I think I was actually on the e-bike, and I started sort of, I'd have her on the lead, and then in these long sections where there would be no... Um, no birds or rabbits or games or extreme distractions. I started letting her off, and I think I was starting to get to the point where I could see in her, and I can. You know, you can generally see that when you went, you'll just see it in just the dog's overall demeanour, <clears throat> its body language, the way it responds to commands, how intense it is when it sees a bird or something in the distance. You can, you can read a dog like that. And I just started seeing her mature and change and get more chill, and I started seeing that I think she's ready. And I think that's why I was letting her off the leash more and more. And anyway, long story short, one day after doing another six or eight months of work, I'm riding the e-bike with her off leash and these pukikos go, they, they were a little bit further away, so it wasn't as bad as a couple of those earlier situations with the seagull and the other pukiko. 
But one day I just saw it, and she was off leash, and a p- couple of pukikos went running away, and um, her head popped up, ears pop up. She sort of flinched forward, and I went, ah, Miko. And she just stopped and waited. She listened. And I thought, sweet, we're getting somewhere. Um, so I started giving her a little bit more freedom, had her off the long line a little bit more. And she started doing it again and again and again. And um, now she's good as gold. We, we I have her off leash all, I go, we go for like 10k walks and rides on the e-bike right through town here. There's ducks and pukikos and cats and stuff everywhere. And, um, and, and now she's at the point where I've actually had a bird season over her. We had a lot of challenges and it didn't go smoothly early on with all of the stuff I've talked about before. But, um, Towards the end of the season, she was retrieving birds well and, and pukekos and ducks and all sorts. And she's got a lot of drive towards birds. She's very birdy. She's the type of dog that like broke and ran out and chased a pukeko until it ran out of steam and fell out of the air and she caught it and killed killed the freaking thing, you know. That's the type of dog that she is. Um, and she's pretty freaking hot. She is. Miko was the leader of the pack as a pup, she was the opposite to the dog that we recommend people choose for a for a um, deer dog. Very forward, confident dog. And um, now she's at the point, I could have Miko off-leash around chicken's piece of cake. But could have I had Miko off-leash around chickens even when I'm there at some point? No way in hell. She would have killed the hell out of them. Uh, would I have Miko off leash around chickens unsupervised now no that would be a mistake and it would be setting her up to fail um so that's it that's that's basically my answer to that you know a young dog like that particularly a breed like a gsp or a vizsla heading dog cross Early on, before they're fully trained, having them off-leash around some of these things is just setting them up to fail. You can definitely train them to the point where you can have them off-leash around distraction like that and you can control them. But it takes work and time. It really does. And um, there's nothing that you can do that you can guarantee that if you leave a GSP or Miko in the same room with a chicken and just lock them in that room and walk away, that you're going to come back any length of time later and that chicken's still going to be alive. It it just doesn't work like that. Uh, Yeah, so last couple of notes. You don't leave working dogs, gun dogs, hunting dogs, farm dogs not locked up and unsupervised. You have to remember what a working dog is. I'll say that again. You don't leave working dogs, gun dogs, hunting dogs, farm dogs not locked up and unsupervised. You have to remember what a working dog is. That right there is key. And there's a lot of people that don't realise that. Devon. <clears throat> hey Paul, not so much a blueprint re- related question, but what are your thoughts on Ultimate Hunting Australia, the program with English pointers where they teach them to range out to find the deer up to a couple of hundred metres out and using tracking collars to then see the dog on point? Grab a drink for this one. It's water. Um, I've talked about this before excuse me this is a bit of a blast from the past Um, I've talked about this before I thought about whether I should answer this question or not but then I, I, I know I should so I'm going to and nothing's changed on this for me for people who have heard me talk about this before um, 
so yeah, there's a guy in Australia, Ultimate Hunting Australia, <clears throat> and he has a program. He he, I think he breeds English pointers. And I'm not 100% sure on this. I don't follow his stuff closely at all. From what I understand, he breeds English pointers, excuse me, and he has a program, I think, where, at least this is what people have told me, where you get one of his dogs, one of his pups, and he teaches you how to train it and helps you train it or something like that. But part of his thing is that you have a tracking collar on the dog, on an indicating dog, and the dog actually, so you'll be in the bush and the dog ranges out up to 200 metres apparently. That's the number I've heard before too and that's Devin's question. Um, the dog ranges out in the bush, out of your sight. So you, you just like, I don't know exactly how it works and I don't really understand. Well, I don't really, to be honest, and we'll get right into this. Okay, I've got a lot of notes on this. But the main question here is what do I think about, and this is what, from what I understand this guy does, the main question here is what do I think about the ultimate hunting thing, ultimate hunting Australia, and this idea of putting a tracking collar on an indicating dog and letting that dog range out. Apparently it's only up to 200 metres. I don't know how or why that's the distance, but uh, apparently that's it. And the dog goes out up to 200 metres. So the dog actually ranges out on its own finds a deer, locks up on it, and then you look at your GPS and the GPS says dogs pointing, which they apparently they do that, and they do do that. The, they do it for barking too. The dog the, Somehow the collar has a sensor in it and it knows when the dog's barking or when the dog's been moving and then stopped and then the, the GPS will say, oh, the dog's pointing now or the dog's barking now. It's not perfect, and I've seen them screw up. And I, and I have used collars before and tracking collars and all of that and the Garmin stuff and the Alphas and all of that. Um, but apparently part of what this guy does is he lets the dog range out up to 200 metres. The dog finds the deer on its own locks up and points it, you look at the GPS, go sweet, the dog's pointing, it's pointing a deer, then you sneak over to where the dog is and you shoot the deer. <clears throat> My notes on this, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. For me, there's loads of issues with it. I don't know anyone that does it. Someone told me that that guy hunts on private land with lots and lots of deer on it. Um, a couple of people have told me that. That could be a huge factor here. Um, that's also hearsay, by the way. And, and by the way, a lot of this is. Um, <clears throat> this whole 200 metre thing is just sort of people ask me about it and I'm only going off what people tell me. Um, but the question is, what do you think about the setup and the idea of going out 200 metres? And this is my answer on, based on that, if that's what this guy does, okay? Um, so that's one thing here. Someone did tell me that this guy hunts on private land with heaps of deer on it. Um, so that could be a factor. You know, you, you may be able to branch out and do different stuff if there's heaps of deer and they don't have that much pressure. I don't know. Um I've also said here, I'm sure that he hunts on public land that's really challenging too. I'm sure he does a variety of stuff. Um, but I don't, I'm, that's just a side note. Um, maybe that could be a factor. Um, going further on through my notes, it's a very different thing to what I do and it's very different to all the best hunters that I know and that I have seen hunting over indicating dogs. So I've done a lot of hunting over indicating dogs and I have worked with and known guys that and girls that hunt over indicating dogs and have shot a lot of stuff over indicating dogs, like thousands of animals, uh, professionally, recreationally, uh, 
in some of the most challenging circumstances imaginable, right from some of the most challenging circumstances imaginable with very low numbers of animals and animals that have had extremely high pressure, right through to very high numbers of animals with very low pressure. So the two extreme ends of the scale, and none of them do that. None of them do anything remotely like that. Um, and I haven't talked to loads of different hunters that I know that don't do this about this idea, but I'd be pretty sure most of them, if I talked to them about it, they'd be like, what? <laughs> like, honestly, I'm just being honest here, okay? And I don't, I don't want to, again, I said... Um, I almost didn't answer this question, but then I thought I should. And honestly, like, good luck to that guy, um, to the guy at Ultimate Hunting Australia um, <clears throat> and the people that are training their dogs that way. I have nothing against it, but this is my honest answer about it. Um, you know, it's very different to anything that I do and anyone and it's very different to anything that anyone that I know that has been good it's very different to anything that they that they do as well um, we also use tracking a lot you know um, I just put that new video up uh, how a deer dog works and I break down those three different hunts including going to the whiteboard and I, and I break down how it all worked, um, you know, tracking deer for five, six hundred metres, um, the track and switch too, so a dog tracking an animal for a few hundred metres and then switching to the wind, um, and also another find there where the dog print took us in five or six hundred metres on the wind and he started taking us in on the wind, we lost it, we kept heading in that direction, and he picked it up again and started again. So there's all of these things that happen. So, you know, we use tracking a lot. We often track for way more than 200 metres up to kilometres. We use the wind a lot, often way more than 200 metres. We use the track and switch. So that's when the dog tracks an animal and then hits the direct wind and starts going in on the wind. The dog can also wind ground scent so go in on the wind hit the ground scent track the ground scent and then switch back to winding and finds can be in extreme circumstances I've had dogs winding animals like 800 metres away a mob of goats 800 metres so in that case sending a dog 200 metres out what happens there? Does the dog get 200 metres out and then you call it back? And then do you go over that 200 metres so you can read the dog and work out what you think is happening and then carry on from there? Or do you let the dog go the 800 metres? Like there's so many reasons why it just doesn't even make sense to me because that 800 metre fine, for example, that was goats and... That was a, a professional goat hunting job and we were like doing a formation hunt through this big valley in a in an area where they were basically working towards eradication and there were quite low goat numbers in this area but someone had spotted some goats in this one area and in some of those circumstances it's like we know there's goats in there, we need to get them. And we've got this huge area, there's bugger all goats here, but there's a couple, there's been some spotted down in there and we just need to sweep the whole area and we can't leave any behind. So we did this big formation hunt and it was sort of this valley um, <clears throat> with a lot of gorse and scrub in the valley, but it was all open outside and around that. And I think there was three or four or five of us and... One guy went up the creek, another guy was on the face, on the true right above the creek, another guy was on the face on the true, I was on the face on the true left, 
and there was a little side branch to the creek. Someone was coming down there or sidling in the face above that and someone was in the open right around the top coming in from there. So we were sort of just sweeping this whole area. We all had dogs, indicating dogs and bailing dogs, tracking gear so we could all see our dogs. We can see each other's dogs. We all had two-way radios. So it's just like this freaking special operation. We just, you do not want to be a goat in that gully. And um, we're hunting it in a way that we can start at the bottom, sweep the whole thing, and, and if we come out the other end without hitting anything, you can be pretty freaking sure that there's no goats in there. And if there are goats in there, we're going to find them. So uh, <clears throat> I, it took us a while to get into position, right, because we started on one side, and the first couple of guys, basically right where we first, they were already in position. So I had to get, one guy had to drop a little bit down, and he's already on his face. Another guy's got to drop right down into the creek. I had to drop right down into the creek, climb up the other side, get on the face, and then I basically, uh, and then, but the guy in the creek's moving up, and we're just talking on the radio like, is your dog, anyone, oh, what's happening? And everyone's like, nah, dogs, my dogs aren't keen. Bailing dogs won't go anywhere. Dog's not indicating, but we'll just keep moving through. As soon as I got up on my face, uh, I'm up high and, and the wind was coming down this valley and Fly was just indicating, indicating. Just like, I, I knew she, I, I didn't, in that scenario, you don't want to be like, Fly's indicating a goat. Fly, I'm on goats, guys, I'm on goats. When like, and not. But you're wrong. <laughs> you just look like a dick. But I just fly was indicating, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm pretty sure. She, and she was just consistent. We just had this beautiful breeze coming straight down this gully. And, <clears throat> but you've got it. You can't just charge off. You we were running this formation, and um, I just said to the guys, flies indicating. Whatever it is, it's far away, but she looks pretty keen. And I'm like, okay, sweet. And the guy, in the, as we walk, move up, I'm waiting for the guy in the creek to move up and the guy in the other face is moving up, the other guy's moving down. And and we're sweeping this whole area. And then it was like, uh, yep, Paul, start moving up. And my job was basically to sidle the whole true left-hand side of this valley. I was like, sweet, moving up, um, flies indicating, and I'll just keep sidling and see what happens. And as I sidled, I actually dropped down into a dip and we dropped out of that wind that we were initially in, and she lost track of it, and um, it was this gorse block. This was um, down Macra in Wellington. Um, those As you're heading out on the ferry on your right-hand side, there's these big gorse faces. We were in there. And um, we dropped down out of the wind, and, and um, I'm just crawling through gorse. We were in wearing like welding gloves and big old school swanny, big old school swan dry, um, chaps, you know, like canvas chaps, and welding glo leather welding gloves because you're just cr you're just swimming through gorse climb you don't really it's so big you don't know whether to go underneath it or over top of it and half the time it's like a combination of the two it's just absolute shithole and so I'm just climbing through this gorse for an hour or so and then I popped up on the next little spur which was back up into that wind and and you know we're about 200 meters closer and flies just now she's winding the exact same direction, the exact same way, but even keener. And I said to the guys, um, fly's still winding, I, I think there's probably something here. And they're like, okay, sweet, whatever, just they're still moving up, no one else was on to anything yet because there was nothing in the area and we just keep doing the sweep of this whole gully. And then as I got further and further up, I was going to get to the point where the wind was sort of coming on, quartering on, 
uh, coming from my ro- from in front of me and out to my left on sort of the 45. And Fly's just winding out across the gully, just looking in one direction, just like that's where I want to go, and that's where the wind's coming from. And we got to the point where if I had to keep going straight up the valley, I would have passed that wind. And I can't remember if it was like, okay, yep, now cut across and come down through there, or okay, go and follow up on this wind. This is like six years ago or something. Um, I think I just ended up getting right up and the, the bush and scrub ended out, pet, petered out, and then it was just like open shit in front of me and flies still winding across to my left and there's bush over there. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to follow this up and come out the other side. And sure enough, drop down, flies getting keener and keener as we get closer and closer. And it was all gorse and shit, but there was a few trees on this one, on on the face on the opposite side. There was a couple, I can't remember what the hell they were, like a bit of five finger and a mahoe and just a couple of sort of bits of trees and all the scrub and shit. And as we got up under those trees, um, <clears throat> there was fresh goat sign. I hit fresh goat sign and Fly just put her nose down and started tracking. And I said, um, so if we rewind right back, you know, this is now, this is probably five, six, seven hundred metres, maybe 800. But I'm tracking a mob of goats with some billy goats in it. So a dog, on a, on a perfect nice breeze, a dog will smell a mob of animals like 800 metres away. And Fly started tracking. And um, so I got on the radio. I, I'm pretty sure I'm tracking goats. And they're like, okay, keep tracking it. I'll come around above. And um, we tracked right up out of the bush. Now we're just on like these open grass flats um, or going up this open grassy ridge. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I'm still out in the open. Oh, I'm out in the open now. Fly's still tracking. I reckon I'm tracking goats. But it didn't really make sense. It was a little bit weird because now we. I'm like, and I'm tracking like back towards Wellington Town, back towards like this, mountain bike track right out in the open and stuff and it was just starting to rain and get windy and shitty and the other guys had sort of done their whole area and they were headed back towards the track and the truck and stuff and I'm like I'm pretty sure I'm tracking goats here okay keep tracking them and I think some of the other guys sort of come around the top and around the back and were like closing off the loop in case I was actually tracking goats and Sure enough, I got right out to the top of the knob and flies getting keen, are still tracking, sort of winding a bit, acting like there's goats out in front. But it, it was a weird setup. Um, the fact that I was like tracking these goats out onto an open paddock. And I'm sneaking along because it looks like we're getting close. And I come up over this brow of this hill and there's just this grassy knob with like, I can't remember how many goats it was five, six, seven or something. Um, and they're all just bunched up on top of this grassy knob out in the wind and rain and shit. And we just pushed them right out into the open. For whatever reason, they'd bailed out to there. They could have gone straight over the top and just out into the abyss of just miles of gorse and shit. But they chose to just park up on this knob for some silly reason. And um, I saw them, got on the radio. I've got... And I'm like, and this is kind of a big deal because on those jobs like that, sometimes a whole crew of guys will be doing days and days of work to shoot one or two goats. We had half a dozen or more pinned down on this freaking knob. You know, this is our whole, like several of us days work here, like sitting on top of this knob. Um, And they could have bailed off into the abyss any time too. They were like 20 metres away from the bush edge over the other side and just off into miles and miles of bush. And I called up on the guys and they come around the other side of them and we basically got the mob surrounded and um, shot them all. And we just got got them basically surrounded um, and got that bush over the other side blocked off hooked into them on the mob shot on the knob 
shot two or three or four or whatever it is on the knob itself and pushed them back out into the open and shot the last couple as they were trying to get away back down to the bush that we'd initially pushed them out of. But, and then you look at, so you look at something like that, and or you look at like that those hunts that I broke down with print explaining and drawing on the whiteboard exactly how he tracked and followed the wind, and, and you're reading the dog the whole time. So, you know, I'm seeing Prince winding down into a gully on, on one of those deer, and I'm like, man, there's something down here. And we drop down into the gully, the wind changes, Prince wanted to head up, and I'm like, okay, that's probably up there. So we go that way, spook a deer, okay, keep going. Um, next thing, the wind's coming down the side, and I'm like, that's probably up there. So, so I'm constantly reading the dog and making decisions as we go. Um, like me working together, the hunter working together with the dog and reading the dog and working together as a team is a constant rolling process, you know. There's no, to, for me, and again, for a lot of, like all of the best indicating dog hunters that I know, there's no application or reason for sending the dog out to like, hey, you go over there, see if you can find one and let me know. <laughs> I'll watch you on the GPS. There's no application for that. 200 metres in the bush is like four minutes walk. So if the dog is indicating that way, I'm going to follow it and see what's down there and read the dog as we go. You know, it's just... It, like I've said it before, and and just to be honest, and I've said this before, I have, and back like this is years ago now. I actually said it's ridiculous. Like it doesn't even make sense, and I don't even understand. It. Or, or, like and I but to, and also as I said, I don't actually know that much about it. I do, all I know is that apparently there's this guy that lets his dogs go out two hundred meters. Um, and you know back to my notes here we often track way more than 200 meters up to kilometers we use the wind a lot often for way more than 200 meters you know up to hundreds and you know five six seven eight hundred meters we switch from winding to tracking to tracking to winding and back and forth the track and switch um, and you need to be there to read the dog and go, okay, yep, dog's indicating that way, so let's go that way. But sometimes it's like, okay, the dog's indicating across there. There's obviously something way over there, but this is a freaking canyon. So I'm going to pull the dog off, go right around, pop up on that spur and see, way over there and see if the dog's still indicating. Like, I've, you've got, I've, I've, you've, I want to stay with my dog. It does Again, it doesn't even make sense. We read and handle the dog a lot. Here's another note. Sending the dog out to hunt on its own and point and then go to the dog with tracking gear just has no place in the way I hunt. And it doesn't have a place with all of the best hunters I have seen hunting over indicating dogs. I might be missing something and... and I encourage if, if someone's like, hey, no, I've actually did this because of that, or someone can explain something else or another side of it in a better way, I'm totally open to that. Um, you know, but this is me answering this question honestly, you know, and I think it's important to, if the, this is what we're doing, to, to really get into these conversations and talk about it. Um, but to go back, you know, Sending the dog out on its own to point and then go to the dog with tracking gear has no place with the way I hunt. It doesn't have a place with all of the best hunters I have seen hunting over indicating dogs. <clears throat> Even with people that have shot thousands of animals in some of the most challenging situations you can imagine. 
low animal numbers, really spooky animals that have been under high pressure. And then if there's really high animal numbers, then there's even less need for it. If there's really high animal numbers, I'm, I'm going to be more likely to keep my dog in. I'm going to be having more contacts. I'm going to want to be more selective. Um, again, I almost didn't want to answer this question, but then I, I know I should. Uh, that's my answer. On it, to be honest, I think it's silly. Um, and but each to their own, each to their own, you know. And honestly, good luck to anyone to the guy from uh, Ultimate Hunting Australia and the people that are training their dogs that way. I have nothing against them. Um, if it works for them and that's what they want to do, awesome. But that's my answer to the question as I understand it at this point. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Costa. Hi Paul, I have a six month old GSP, just finished the recall drill and now teaching the sit and stay command. We've been using the long line and stepping on it and pushing the pup's backside down results in the pup biting the shit out of my hand and the long line with no chance of getting the pup to sit still. Only way I can get him to sit and hold a sit or stay for a couple of seconds is with a bit of food. I know it's not recommended in the blueprint, but is there a way to incorporate treat training and slowly come off it? Or is it teaching the pup to only obey when there's food in front of it? Cheers, man. Much appreciated. Uh, man, we've got there's a couple of biggies in this one, eh? <laughs> I was thinking only eight questions. I'm getting back to it a little bit faster. Cruzy Q and A. She's a big one. It's even Prince stood up here. He's but he had a shake and he's like had a stretch and he's looking at me. Uh, I'm gonna take a real quick break here and we'll come back and hook into this one. Okay, um, I'll read that question again, just back from a break. Um, hi Paul, I have a six month old GSP, just finished the recall drill and now teaching the sit and stay, have been using the long line, stepping on it, pushing the pup's backside down, results in the pup biting the shit out of my hand and the long line with no chance of getting the pup to sit still. Only way I can get him to sit and hold a sit or stay for a couple of seconds is with a bit of food, <laughs> a bit of good old treat training. I know it's not recommended in the blueprint, but is there a way to incorporate treat training and slowly come off it? Or is it teaching the pup to only ob obey when there's food in front of it? Cheers, man. Much appreciated. Thanks, Costa. Thanks for the question. Thanks for following the blueprint. Uh, <clears throat> my notes on this. You need to use consistency and persistence. Consistency and persistence. Use the techniques correctly. Make sure you're not offsetting the training with destructive stuff. Not too much freedom and horseplay, etc. Basically what I was talking about earlier, that you're doing everything correctly inside of training and that you're not doing a whole bunch of stuff outside of training that's screwing training up. You need to make sure you're doing all of the training correctly. And then it's consistency and persistence, and that's it. You know, and all of the nitty gritty detail, how you do this demonstration and everything for 15 hours is in the Dear Dog Training Blueprint. But I've got a lot of notes on this, man. This, this raises a lot of stuff too. So make sure you're not offsetting the training with destructive stuff outside of training, too much freedom and horseplay. Make sure someone else isn't doing that too, so that you're not doing everything correctly, but then someone else is screwing it all up while you're not around. Here's the here's a biggie. Don't use treat training, just don't. <laughs> and I don't laugh to be facetious, but seriously, don't use treat training. Just don't. 
Using treat training is like drinking Coca-Cola so you can have energy in the gym to have a good workout to try and lose weight. Using treat training is like drinking Coca-Cola so you have energy in the gym to have a good workout to try and lose weight. It defeats the whole purpose, it skirts around the issue, it avoids the real problem. Not using treat or electric collars and instead using what I call real dog training tackles the real issue head on. That's what you're there to do, train the dog. Build a relationship with the dog. Learn to work with the dog. Using treats and e-collars is just shooting yourself in the foot and missing that opportunity. It's harder in the short term, but that's the whole point. It's better in the long term. You put in the work, force yourself to do it properly, and you get a real result. It forces you to do it properly and it gets a real result. It's so important. I really encourage people to do it all without treats. I really do think treat training can be detrimental. You don't need it. It can be a huge distraction. I know some good trainers do it and get good results and again I have nothing against that, each to their own. But I don't use treats and I don't recommend anyone that follows the blueprint uses treats. And it's not a small thing, I'm not flippant about it. That's the thing, right? Like that, and it's a it's a bit of a silly analogy, the Coca Cola thing. And analogies are silly, and they can be a bit squirrely. And it, I, I don't really love a good analogy, but sometimes, and I feel weird about them, but sometimes they sort of work. They can help. Using treat training is like drinking Coca-Cola so you have energy in the gym to have a good workout to try and lose weight. Like, you're going to the gym to lose weight, but Coca-Cola makes you fat and you're drinking Coca-Cola to get a good workout to lose weight. It's like, to me, it's two opposite ends of the spectrum. And I have, maybe I need to do some writing about this or something because I haven't got this, uh, I'm not articulating this well. I haven't got this like wrapped up in a neat little bow on how to explain it. But um, like you're going to the gym to work out to lose weight. You're training your dog, you're going out to train with the dog to work with it to get real control. Putting a treat in the middle, you're like circumnavigating all of the good work and the work that you have to put in to get the real result. You're like trying to, you're sidestepping the thing that you're there to do. You're like avoiding the real issue. And why I believe if you if you get into dog training and you and you understand it to a level and you execute it to a level where you can get there without treats. I think you get to a better place than you do with the treats. And that's not to say you can't get there using treats, but they they 
distract you from what you really need to be doing and working out and understanding. It's that oh, it's a really good freaking line that once you understand dog training well enough to use the treats perfectly, you understand that you don't need the treat. It's like a chicken and egg situation. Once you understand the dog and reading and timing and pressure and praise and all of that and what you're trying to do with the treat, you realize you don't even need the treat anymore. And it's it's silly because it's it's actually scientifically fundamentally like flawed and proven incorrect now. The old line on treat training used to be that oh dogs have a stronger psychological response to the food than they do to praise that's been proven incorrect like in like 2016 it was somewhere it's not even that long ago it's in like the last 10 years they did a study where they 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 must have trained the freaking dogs to hold still and keep their head still but they did it with a brain scan they were, they were scanning brain activity in dogs and it was something very, very high, like 9 out of 10 or 90 or 95% of dogs have a stronger positive emotional response to praise than they do to a treat. <laughs> Google it. So, you know, and treat training does get that pretty instant, the dog looking up and every and, and, and sitting down and looking up and gets their focus and attention. You know, it shortcuts to something that looks like what you're trying to achieve really quickly. But I think that's the biggest problem with it. You don't want to shortcut that stuff. You want to do it. That's the whole idea. And the process of learning that and doing it without the treats is what gets the quality result. It's, it's what turns you into a dog trainer and gets you and the dog working together properly for each other. The treats is just putting something else in between that takes away from that. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get that connection and bond between you and the dog for each other. I want the dog looking here at me, not at my hand, for a freaking treat. Like honestly, it's um that's what I say in the in the part one of the deer dog training blueprint when I talk about real dog training is that, and I've seen it over and over again, man, over and over again, and I I, exper I worked with all of this stuff, treat training and place boards and e-collars and all of that early, years ago. And, and I went right down that path, and I didn't really like it, because at the same time, I, as I started experimenting with that, I started understanding all of the other principles of dog training and I started understanding all of the things that you need to understand when you talk about once you understand how to use treats properly you understand that you don't need them anymore I was starting to understand all of that stuff as I was experimenting with treats and I was just like I was, and I was doing treat training and place boards and mucking around with e-collars but I was already working out how to do it without all of that stuff. So I had that over there and I was work doing the trick training, all this. It didn't it doesn't even didn't even make sense at all. And in fact, I got a lesser result with the dogs that I did the treat training with. I felt it made it worse. It screwed it up. Like honestly. And the amount of times 
that someone's like, oh, my dog's doing this, that, and the other, and it's just, God, I just can't get it, and I keep working, and oh, I am doing a little bit of treat training, but surely that's not it, so what do you think I should do? And I'm like, stop freaking treat training, <laughs> and and do it, do it properly. Get the dog to focus on you, not the treat. It's sign. It scientifically works better. That used to be the old line. Dogs have a higher emotional response to treat than they do to. And there's a new study out that that's not true. So dogs literally, the, the whole idea of treat training is scientifically flawed. So why are you even doing it? Um, I've, I've spoken about this in Q&As before and videos in the past, ages ago. Um, but it still keeps up coming up, you know, and a lot of the stuff that keeps coming up is from stuff that people are hearing elsewhere, you know, and and man, I'd, I'd never say, like, don't listen to anyone else, only listen to me. That's the last thing I'd ever want to say. Um, but, and that, that's why these conversations are so important, you know, um, and, and the long answers and the, the big talks and, that's why these Q and A's are good because it, it it allows me to dig, it allows you guys to ask questions, and it allows me to go in deep on them, and then you can ask questions back based on what I've said, and we can go. We just you need to talk about this stuff, big time. Um, <clears throat> but in the whole grand scheme of things. You don't need treats. And again, going back to what I began to say just before, in part one of the blueprint, I say the amount of times I've worked with people and that I started seeing this very early on in my dog training career and I'd work with someone and they'd be having all of these problems and I'd, I'd start working with them, and they might be using treats and e collars and stuff. <clears throat> and look, get, saying getting rid of treats and getting rid of the e collars did not train the dog. That's not what I'm. That's, that doesn't train the dog. But you get that out of the way, and you've only got one thing to focus on, and that's the relationship between you and the dog. That's it. There's no bullshit in between. There's no, oh, grab the remote now and do this or that or get the treat and, you yeah, know, he'll do it for the treat. Yeah, see, he's doing it now. Who cares if it, the dog does it for the treat or it stops because you're shocking it with the e-collar? You need the dog to do it because you're working as a team. And you need that bond and connection and relationship and control and understanding. Like the treat, it's doing it for the treat. The e-collar, it's doing it so it doesn't get a shock. You get rid of the treat and the e-collar and all you've got left is proper management and understanding and dialogue and a relationship, and the dog understanding what you want it to do, and the dog understanding why what you want it to do is a good idea. You know, and you and the dog working together towards a common goal, and getting the dog to, un in the case of a hunting dog, getting the dog to understand that you as much as the dog wants to hunt, which is a lot, which is more than you, you want to hunt as much as the dog wants to hunt as well. And and managing everything through to the point where the dog understands that and and 
the dog has all the tools to do that properly and it understands that that's what you want to do too, so now it wants to do it with you. Like to come right back and be walking around with this bag of treats. It, yeah. <clears throat> um, it's back to those notes, you know, it defeats the whole purpose, it skirts around the issue, of, it avoids the real problem. Not using treats or e-collars and instead using what I call real dog training tackles the real issue head on. That's what you're there to do, train the dog, build a relationship with the dog, learn to work with the dog. Using e-collars and treats is just shooting yourself in the foot and missing that opportunity. And again, back to this, because um, some of the stuff can be hugely um, confronting for a lot of people. You know, there's people out there, really good people, that uh, that get good results and train really good dogs using treat training. I'm just saying that I don't use treat training and I've got these systems of dog training that don't use treat training. There's really good there's a there's really good reasons why we don't use treat training, and I recommend people that are using my systems don't use treat training. That's it. I know some good trainers do it and get good results, and I have nothing against that each to their own. But as far as someone that's following the blueprint that's having trouble with their dog that's using treats. Again, like the question before this, this is my answer to it. I don't recommend anyone following the blueprint uses treats, and it's not a small thing, and I'm not flippant about it. Um, <clears throat> so six-month-old G, back to the question, Costa with a six-month-old GSP, just finished the recall drill and now teaching the sit and stay <clears throat> Try to push the pup's backside down and it bites the shit out of my hand in the long line with no chance of getting the pup to sit still. Like, there's something's wrong there, man. You're saying, the only way I can get him to sit and hold a sit or stay for a couple of seconds is with a bit of food. How long have you been using food for? You know, when did you start using the food? Um, you're saying, uh, is there a way to incorporate treat training and slowly come off it, or is it teaching the pup to only obey when there's food in front of it? Is teaching the pup to only obey when there's food in front of it? And if you started using food early on, that and, and you've worked your way out to this point and now you're trying to do it without food, that's why you're having this problem. With a six-month-old pup doing all the blueprint stuff properly, you should have a pretty, the, the beginnings of a pretty tidy little sit going on. And a lot most people do. You know? And I think there's a very good argument to be made that... Um, there could be other things at play too. You might not have been doing the training properly. You might have been doing a bunch of stuff outside of training that's been screwing yourself over. But it might just be because you've been using treats all the way too. I don't know. Um, and, and this is exactly why, you know, I just say get rid of it, you know. And back to what I say in part one of the Dead Dog Training Blueprint, the amount of times I've had serious I've worked with people that have had serious issues with the dog and the sooner we get treats and e-collars out of the picture, the sooner we start making progress. Like I'm not saying it's going to be easy, like stop giving the dog treats and it's going to turn into the perfect dog. What I'm saying is, is get rid of the treats and keep training properly and make sure you're doing everything properly and you'll start making progress. But, so that's, I think I've covered it. 
again, I really en- encourage people to get back to us on this, on all of these questions. If I've missed something out, if I've interpreted something wrong, incorrectly, if you're still stuck with it, if you're making progress with it, let, let me know. Let us know. I'm really open to feedback um, and, and updates are really good and all of that. Hayden, let's grab a drink. <clears throat> Hayden, hi Paul, my pup Macy is a lab cross collie. She's just about five months and we are just starting part three. <clears throat> we had a few delays with medical troubles with the pup but she's all good now. She's coming along really nicely. The only problem is other dogs. She loses focus and can't stop looking at the other dogs. I keep them at a distance but she is always turning and stopping to look back at them as we walk away and just seems distracted for the rest of the session. My question is when she does this, is it best for me to stay relaxed and just walk away with her without even acknowledging the other dogs as this is what I've been doing and seems to be slowly working? It's a really good example of like an issue where you just stay calm and just be consistent and persistent and you'll just slowly improve. Like you've got a young dog, a lab collie cross, five months old and and it's distracted by other dogs and he's saying, uh, I just stay relaxed and just walk away with her without even acknowledging the other dogs. And it's slowly working. And that's, that's dog training. That is just rinse and repeat and keep at it. Keep doing it correctly. Stay calm. Rinse, repeat. Consistent, persistent. And you do the right thing. Do everything properly. And it, you, you'll just slowly make progress. Little bit by little bit. And months later, you'll be like, man, my... She's actually pretty good now. And then he goes on to say, Hayden goes on to say, or should I give a stern command of disapproval, then walk away, and every time she looks back, give a command of disapproval. Cheers for doing the blueprint, all of the podcasts. It's an awesome resource. Thanks, Hayden. Um, My answer is I would do a combination of both. Just ignore and move off when she isn't being too over the top and give a command of disapproval at key times if she's escalating. So if you're just walking along and you know she goes from just walking smooth and looking ahead and maybe you know keeping track of the ground and just looking ahead, everything's smooth, and then she sort of sees a dog out to the side but she keeps walking forward and she's sort of distracted and she veers off to the right. If you just keep walking, in in the mere fact that you just keep walking along, pulls her back away from it and she sort of slowly veers away from it and as you keep walking she forgets about it. The more you can do that, the better. And that's coming back to that principle of pressure and praise and it's always the minimum amount of pressure or praise necessary to get the job done you don't want to you know if she just casually looks to her right and notices a dog and veers a little bit out of line you don't want to give her a big check on the long line and you scream her name and make this big performance when you could have just said nothing and kept walking um so the 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 calmer you can keep it and the less less that you can react the better but if that's not making progress and she keeps escalating, so for example, if you saw a dog out to your to your right, she sees it, she turns her head but keeps walking forward, then she starts veering out to the right and you keep trying to walk forward, then she starts hopping on her front feet uh, and gives a little whimper like she wants to break and chase like the next step's going to be barking and hitting the end of the long line out to the right, 
as she escalates, I just up, check on the long line, change her direction, walk straight away from it. And if she if she turned around and tried to go back while you're walking in the opposite direction, then I'd give her a I'd escalate even more. Escalate to meet her escalation. You know? Um, the minimum amount of pressure or praise required to get the job done. So you're doing enough required to get the job done. It's not always minimum amount. It's minimum amount to get the job done. So if you need to escalate to get the job done, escalate. Um, <clears throat> give her a good stern command of disapproval. Ah, cut it out. And you don't, you don't even need to give her a hard check. Just cut it out and walk in the other direction. If she's still trying to go in one direction and you're going the other holding a lead, she's you're going to turn her. And just make it clear that cut it out. That's not what we're all about. But again, it's always the minimum amount required to get the job done. And I've talked about this before. You can actually create a situation by loading up and, you know, max, 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 max. You can start injecting tension and energy into your dog looking at other dogs. So you've got to be very careful with that. That's why it's always, your goal is to always keep things as calm and quiet as possible and just cut it off swiftly at key times. So ignore and move off when she's not being too over the top and give a command of disapproval when she's escalating. And you're always trying to just up and then back to dead calm. Good girl. Let's go. Good girl. Sit. Good girl. Goes for the dog. Ah! Come here. Good girl. You, you need a switch like that. Very clear and black and white. <clears throat> AJ, looking at doing some possum trapping, any dramas taken my dog? Just do the usual aversion training with possums when out checking traps, as I would be trapping where we do a fair bit of hunting, so would take the rifle while trap checking. Um, yeah, so I answered this. I talked a lot about possums in the last Q and A. The guy was talking about the question was about feeding your dogs possums, and I went into quite a talk about how I u I've used indicating dogs as full time trapping dogs as well and they're leading me around my trap line taking me to every trap um, I've used big game indicating dogs, deer dogs um, also when I've been shooting possums for fur and I'm shooting possums in the cut over and I'm using my old lab to retrieve possums and then I'm going out indicating deer with her the next day um, so you can do it all. I had a big talk about it in the last Q and A. So there's not much need for me to get. And I'm pretty sure AJ jumped over and listened to that. Um, <clears throat> my notes on this, like I said, I talked about this a lot in the last Q and A. You should be fine taking the dog. Be careful with the dog standing in traps. Um, Long story short, if you do, it's, it's all in the last Q&A. So, and I did quite a talk on it, so I'm not going to go back into all of that. But you 100% can. If, if, like, I would say if you've got a deer dog that you've done a ton of training with and you're really serious about hunting over and all of that and you do, like, four days of trapping possums a year, and it's not important to take the dog, I'd say, yeah, you know what, just leave the dog behind. Don't, why complicate it? But if you're going to be doing a lot of trapping, you want to take your dog, it's a pain in the ass leaving it behind, you don't know where to leave it, you haven't got anyone to look after it, you really want to take your dog, you maybe want to shoot a deer before, after or during trapping, and you're going to be doing a lot of trapping, and you want to take your dog, take your dog, it'd be sweet as. If it's all properly trained, you've done your aversion training, just take it. 
and you'll be fine. And I talked about, that's what I went into a big long talk about that I'm not going to go into again, is the whole logistics of dogs indicating possums and pulling them off them and them getting used to it and how it can still happen occasionally when the possum's very close but it's not really a factor and the dog gets to know when you're trapping and when you're deer stalking and if you've done your non-target species aversion training it's a properly trained dog you've got control of it it's just it really isn't an issue at all and um in a lot of ways that extra time that you'll spend with your dog can be beneficial to your deer stalking um and Yep, you'll be fine taking your dog. Be careful with your dog standing in traps. They can, they will do it. Traps can hurt the dog, but the dog doesn't do it many times from experience. Um, the big, yeah, and your dog, the thing with most possum traps, the trap's small enough and the dog's foot's big enough that when the dog stands in the possum trap, the trap can't close far enough to get a lot of power in the clothes like the the trap doesn't get grunty a possum trap like a victor um a number one victor doesn't get real snappy until like the last two inches or even an inch of its closing of its clothes you know um so a dog foot i've seen dogs stand in possum traps and just stand in them and give a little yerp, yelp and they just get a fright and just their reaction of lifting the foot snaps the foot out of the trap because the trap can't close far enough and it's just like next to nothing and it's almost not even enough to teach the dog to not do it again. I've also seen it where they've, and this is what can happen, they can close on the dog's foot and if it just gets like the end of their toe with the dog's first joint, in the trap like so it's the dog the end the dog's end pad it's toe pad is in the trap with just uh one or two toes the trap can get us get a it can get a hard tight close and the danger is the dog freaking out and pulling on the trap that's how the dog will hurt itself and potentially break a toe or something so you want to be really careful with it. Um, <clears throat> I generally keep the dog in very close or at heel, um, and I'd be and and they'd go to stand. You know, if they went to walk near the trap, I'd say, "Ah, get out of it!" And I'd I'd try to basically teach them aversion training around the trap. But it was, it, I never managed to do that successfully to the point where the dog never stood in a trap. They always ended up standing in a trap eventually. And, um, but I was always literally right there and watching them so closely that the second they stood in the trap, I'd be like pouncing on them and grabbing the dog by the scruff of the neck so they can't run and pull and injure their foot and letting them out of the trap. And after that, the dog knew exactly what a trap was and would give them a, a bloody wide berth. And it's funny watching a dog uh, that knows what a possum trap is <laughs> and how good at it they get, like walk, giving the trap a little berth. Um, another funny story on that was, um, I think I've touched on this before somewhere in a Q&A or something about how that there's that principle of one moment can count forever and a dog in a in a marked situation a dog can learn a life lesson in one instance and it can happen good and bad you know like a dog chasing and breaking chasing and killing something for instance in some circumstances that can create an issue that you'll have to deal with for forever with steadiness and you'll have to mend and the dog will always have breaking in the back of its mind. It could be a real pain in the ass. You can generally work past it though to a very good point, like I have with Miko. But um <clears throat> you know, in the case of print, he's never broken and chased anything. <clears throat> it's not even in the back of his mind. He's not flinching and thinking about chasing because he's never done it. Um but talking about traps and dogs learning something in an instant, uh 
Das ist so was. Tessa. I can remember the ridge I was on. I can remember the section of the ridge I was on. <coughs> um, and it was her first day on a trap line with set traps. I think I'd, I'd taken her in and I'd pre-fed a line. I had to build a hut, build a camp for a couple of days. I'd maybe gone for a couple of hunts. I'd pre-fed a line and carry traps up. Uh, and I think it was on the very first day setting traps, actually. She stood in her first trap. And I'd been real careful telling her to get out of the way and watch out. And um, and it was, it's not too bad when you're setting traps because there's no set traps ahead of you and you're setting them as you go. And I'd sort of nail it to the tree, set it, see where Tessa is, send her out front, and we carry on. <laughs> and... Uh, I was kneeling in front of a tree, about half a meter away from the tree. I just set the trap, and and I, I used to carry a um, it was actually an empty Powerade bottle, and I had a string tied around the, like just under the thread of the bottle. Like if you're watching this podcast on video, right there on any bottle, it's got that little ring just under the thread where the cat goes on um, that the bottle closes down on and you can tie a bit of string around that. If you tie a bit of string real tight, I had a bit of string tied real tight around a Powerade bottle like that and then I had another loop coming off it so I could put my bait bottle on my belt and then I could just reach down, tip it up into my hand and, and get a little handful of my flower, my flower bait that I used to put scented oils in and then I put a little pile on each side of the trap and rub a bit up the tree. And I've been keeping, being careful with Tessa all day and um, managing the whole thing. It was a real pain in the ass. And, um, you know, middle of the day, few, several hours into the day, and um, I just set this trap and looked down and I was pouring the bait into my hand about to put the bait on. And Tessa had been about two metres out to my left. And for some reason, she wanted to come back past me, right between the tree and me, which was right where the trap was. And I looked down, and I seen her coming out of the corner of my eye. And just reaction, it wasn't a command or anything. I said, hey, watch out! Right, right as I caught her. So I just said, hey, watch out! And as I turned around and said, watch out! I caught her, and she stood in the trap. It all happened at the same time in about a, like probably less than a second. Watch out, snap! And she's bloody yelping and pulling back and I pulled her back towards me and she's struggling like anything and I had to sort of just get her in this big bear hug with one arm and and open the trap with the other arm and pull out of it. And after that, she knew exactly what a freaking trap was. I don't think she ever stood in one ever again. Maybe once, one time like months or years later, but watch out, she knew what watch out meant uh, forever after that. And and it was maybe it was a tone thing too and it was a bit of a command of disapproval, but um, after that, and that was the word I used to say, and you used to be able to say, watch out, and she'd just be like, it, it was intrinsically linked with her in danger. Um, if you were... If you had a gas cooker set up and you were trying to boil the billy and um, on the ground and Tessa come in like looking like she might knock it over or something, you say, hey, watch out, and she'd just stop and like lean back, stop moving in the direction she was moving in and just like back off. Um, it was quite a hard case. But, um, but yeah, long story short, you're fine to take a dog on the trap line. You've got all the non-target species aversion training in the blueprint. Um, you should have good control of the dog to stop it like attacking the first possums that it sees. You've got that whole trap thing to contend with. Another One other thing with the traps that I've had um, is the, they can, the dogs can bite you. A dog bloody standing in a possum trap, even a really well-trained dog that you got a really good relationship with um, 
I've had a dog bite me pretty hard. It stood in a trap, and I did exactly what I was talking about with Tessa. I was right there. Excuse me. I grabbed this dog so it didn't pull and hurt itself, and I went to go for the trap. And I don't know if it thought I was doing it to it or it thought it had something on its foot that was a tail or whatever the hell it was. Um, but the dog stood in the trap, started yelping, started pulling. I grabbed it, pulled it back, and I was grabbing for the trap. And it just instinctually reached down and was biting at the trap. And my hand was on the trap. And it bit me pretty hard. Um, and dogs can... I've been bitten a couple of times by dogs and um, dogs can open, do it's incredible the power that dogs have in their bite. They'll, they'll open you up like accidentally. Uh, so yeah, definite, pretty careful with the dogs and the traps. Um, saying about taking the rifle, you can definitely take the rifle with you and Tessa used to indicate deer off the trap line and I'd take the rifle and sometimes and go down and shoot the deer on the trap line and hang them up or whatever and carry meat with me or um i'd usually only take the rifle if it was something like uh i had a i i had a trap line that ended up high and i had like dead walking back i had quite a bit of ground to cover back with no traps i didn't really like mixing trapping and hunting to be honest and um if I need a venison, I'd usually, um, you know, do it after trapping, before or after trapping, in between trapping on days off. As the trap line started winding down, I'd get back to camp a little bit early and go for evening hunts. Occasionally, I'd, if there was somewhere on my trap line, like um, if the possums were eating the, if, if the pigs were getting into the dead possums and there's pigs all over my line, I'd carry the rifle and try to shoot one of them. Or if there was a really good spot, like a head gut up high on my trap line with deer, I'd take the gun. But it was always a pain in the ass carrying the gun while trying to do traps and then trying to hunt in the middle of a trap line. And then you had to carry the meat back with you. And it just, I'd always just got to the point where um, I'd just hunt outside of trapping. And it was always annoying too. Because you carry your rifle all day doing the trap line, which was a pain in the ass because you had to um, carry possums and do traps and carrying a rifle was just a mega pain in the ass. And you do that and almost never see anything, the old Murphy's Law, and then the next day you'd leave the rifle behind and there'd just be deer and pigs. You'd see a deer just standing there looking at you thinking, like, where were you yesterday, you know? But just that's just um, like Murphy's Law, you know? Um, AJ goes on to say How, PS how's the knee going I had my surgery 5 months ago 5 months after surgery and rehab and knee feels mint knee was ready after 3 months stoked to hear your knee's better AJ um, my knee's better I've been working on it a lot um, I didn't get the cortisone shot um and I've just been basically researching it and working out exactly what this freaking thing is. It's the it's iliotibial band syndrome. Um, Google that iliotibial band syndrome. They call it runner's syndrome, runner's knee. Um, it's basically an inflamed tight iliotibial band. Um, rubbing on the outside of my knee and it's been strange actually and it's been interesting I had a similar journey back in the day with my back um, when I had back problems that got really bad and I was going to doctors and physios and specialists and surgeons and everyone had a different idea of what to do about it and the eventual how I eventually started making progress with it was without was quite different to what any one of those <laughs> doctors and physios and surgeons and everyone think said I ultimately ended up fixing my back by like doing deadlifts and squats and exercising and stretches um, 
which physio was telling me to do exercises and stretches, but not the right ones. It was quite a different path that ended up actually fixing it. But uh, maybe I must have just had the wrong physio. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of professionals out there that could have helped me with it. Um, I just didn't bump into the right people at the right time. But um, and it's been interesting following the crumb trail on this iliotibial band syndrome because early on I had doctors and physios saying um, do these stretches and do rolling on it so use rollers use a foam roller you know and roll out that whole side of my leg and my knee do all of the stuff and then I found equally qualified people saying don't use a roller on iliotibial band it makes it worse and I'm like shit (laughs) I've got one professional telling me to roll it another one saying nah don't do that it makes it worse I had some people saying rest it very important to rest an iliotibial band syndrome other people saying you've got iliotibial band syndrome because you haven't done enough exercise so you need to make it stronger but don't do too much so there's been all all the stuff a lot of contradictory stuff and Um, yeah, it's been quite the journey. Um, what I have sort of, uh, the train of thought that I'm going down now, and I think this is, and this seems to be working is, and I think this is what it is, and everyone kind of agrees on this actually, is that it happens, it comes about often from, uh, being inactive for a period of time getting weak and imbalances, muscle imbalances, and then um, all of a sudden going flat out for a while. And that's exactly what I did. And um, for a while I didn't quite know what part I had to strengthen or what I had to work on and stuff like that. But um, very roughly it seems to be that and why it's called runner's syndrome and why it seems to be uh, an overuse thing, but then there's also the connection with the overuse, then underuse, then overuse again. That's actually what it is. Because if you do a lot of walking or running, which I've done a lot of walking, and my legs are and particularly in my legs have always been strong from the amount of walking that I've done. So I've got these strong tight tendons that are probably pretty beefy and that iliotibial band on me is probably pretty strong and tight um, and quite well developed and if you stop which is what I, I have done particularly over the last few years. I haven't been doing as much hunting. I've been doing a lot of this sort of stuff, sitting around talking for ages, a lot of writing, a lot of sitting and screen time, living in town, not doing as much hunting, and then COVID and lockdown, and it just sort of went from bad to worse, like activity-wise. And I was get I was slack with um I've been I'm way I'm into it now, but I went through a period before I injured my knee where I was pretty slack on my fitness. Real slack actually, and my my plan was, and it's a stupid freaking plan, um, and it's ultimately how I injured my knee, was I went, well, when I do start hunting again, I'm going to do so much hunting, it's not going to matter. So I just went, like, buttoned off on the fitness and thought I'm going to, I'm going to get fit hunting. So I, I planned to do a lot of hunting. When I injured my knee, few months ago I was going to start hunting and do heaps um, and hunting gets you fit you know and I was carrying a few extra kilos I knew my cardio wasn't that good I knew I wasn't that fit I've done and, and I've done that there's two or three times in my life that I've done that markedly where through work and not hunting as a job and a few other things um I haven't done much hunting, I haven't done much fitness, I've got pretty out of shape and I've got a little bit overweight and then I've hit a period where I do a heap of hunting again and I lose all the weight and I get really fit and I get really strong again just through hunting. Um, And that was, and I've done that a couple of times when I've lost 
Well, back in the day, at one point, I was over 100 kilos and pretty unfit. This is going way back, like early 2000s. Um, it was 2009 when I started full-time, well, I was already full-time trapping in the Kaimais and on farm edges and riding motorbikes around and walking around paddocks and stuff and doing a bit of hunting, um, riding dirt bikes a lot. Then in 2009, uh, I started doing it full-time in the Uawiras, which is no motorbikes, no paddocks, all on the foot, and I started doing a lot of Ks, but it sort of worked up to it. But I got after, and then I did ended up doing several seasons of that really full-on, a lot of it for a few years. I got down to 87 kilos at one point, and I'm 6 foot 5 or 6 foot 6. Um, I was like, I like, I was freaking people out. I was getting out of the bush and people were looking at me just like, you look like you've had cancer or something. I, I, I was real light. Um, <clears throat> and now I'm right back up to, I was up to 110, actually like 112, 114 kilos. So that's a big difference, man. Um, I'm back down to about 105 at the moment. <clears throat> I need to lose another five or even 10, um, but back to the knee, what happened was doing a lot of sitting, so I've got these legs that have done a lot of walking and running, they're pretty well, they're de quite developed, they have been really strong in the past, I've got big tight, tent that iliotibial band has had a lot of work in its life, so it's quite meaty and tight, and then all of a sudden, a period of not enough activity through lockdown, and then I wasn't working out through lockdown, way too much sitting, just way too much sitting, and all your glutes and hip flexors and um, all of the muscles around your, your glutes is a huge one, glutes, hip flexors, actually your whole leg gets weak, so all of the muscles get weak, but that big frickin' rubber band is still tight. And so it's a big imbalance and um, things just aren't running right, you know. So, <clears throat> um, and there's a lot of stuff on that. Basically, iliotibial band issues through having weak glutes is a big one. Um so I've been doing a lot of squats, uh, lifting weights, and also um, I'm getting into like a freaking fitness podcast now. Um, and this, I actually want to—I'm actually going to do a podcast. I'm actually doing quite a bit of stuff on this soon. But um, <clears throat> long story short, on the need to move on and get back to the dog training stuff is um, oh, hang on. Oh, this is the last question anyway. Um. I've got to build up, I've got to slowly build up strength. I went from being really fit and strong to doing nothing, so my muscles got weak, but I still had big, grunty, tight tendons. And so imagine having this big, grunty, tight tendon, but now all the muscles are around it are weak. And so you've got this big, tight tendon like, dominating the my my leg but the muscles aren't strong enough to keep everything aligned and pulling the right way one video that i watched um with a really really like knowledgeable fitness professional guy said that the iliotibial band is a big band that connects down on the outside of your knee and it comes up and runs up your thigh, this the outside of your thigh, right up and hooks up into the top of your hips and on the outside of your hip. But the, your whole glute comes around and joins into the into that band, and the and the so the glute pulls it from a different angle. So, so the glute changes the angle of 
pull on your iliotibial band. The way this guy explained it uh, was really good. And then I found two or three guys, once I found like the crumb trail of that school of thought on the iliotibial band, I went down that and I found several guys explaining it, like uh, strength and conditioning guys from the States. I found these two guys that were like doctors and physios that had a really good YouTube channel talking about it. And that's what, mate, as soon as I start, found out that idea on it, I was like, that's what it is. And they're talking about how it's often when you've been fit and strong, so your iliotibial band is really tight and strong, and then you've um, had a long period of inactivity, you've done too much sitting, which makes your glute weak. And then you go out and start to walk on it, and the angle of pull is messed up on your iliotibial band because when your glute's strong, your glute's doing a lot of the work and the walking and your iliotibial band's trying to pull straight up and down but when but the glute comes around and connects into the iliotibial band when the glute's working correctly and is strong enough that's pulling the iliotibial the top half of it like back towards your your ass basically um and when the glute's weak, it's not doing that, and the 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 direction of pull on the iliotibial band is straight up, and it sort of it screws up. It's all dysfunctional, and that's when it starts rubbing on the outside of the knee and screwing up. So um, that's sort of the theory behind it. But uh, and I think it's just an overall strength and conditioning um, thing. So what I once I clicked on to that theory behind it, um, and it's sort of the theory of if you just go out, if you don't do anything, and then you just go out and go balls to the wall, you'll have injuries exactly like that. It's just such a classic example of that type of do bugger all, go out. So do bugger all, get all weak and uh, muscle and body imbalances your body's all dysfunctional and crooked and not working right and then you go out and work, go flat out and you just break something um, and I was probably lucky that it was only iliotibial band I didn't like tear a meniscus or something worse you know or do an ACL or something like that um, and there's actually a it's called the envelope. Envelope or something. I've got. I haven't even got notes on this, but I've got to do a proper podcast on this. Um, but it's basically the idea that the in this the something envelope. It's like a whole theory that this guy come up with, like some doctor fitness guy, that wherever you're at, if you do less than a certain point you'll have health issues, and if you do more than a certain point, you'll have health issues. You'll create injuries and pain and dysfunction. You have a you have an operating window. Um, and the way to, to increase what your body is capable of doing without injury, you have to slowly build. Um, and that's why I said that what I did was ridiculous, which is, ah, I'm going to be hunting flat out soon in a couple of months anyway, so I'm going to do nothing, <laughs> and I'll make up for it out there. That's how I injured myself. Worst idea ever. In hindsight, I don't even know how I come up with, how I got to that. It's just laziness and silliness, you know. Um, so what I started doing is I started walking every single day, and I started like cruising instead of going flat out. I started just um, making sure I was on my feet every single day. And I've actually got a um, adjustable desk that goes up and down. So I started doing more of my work standing and making sure bare minimum I was walking every single day. I started doing body weight exercises. So starting light, I was doing body weight squats, um, body weight deadlifts, like stiff legged deadlifts. Um, I started doing more upper body stuff as well, um, just incorporating everything. Um, started back light on the weights. 
then after a few couple of few weeks of um, several workouts of body weight squats I started doing weighting squats weighted squats with a barbell I've got a squat rack in that you've you've I've posted up on my Instagram I've been doing um, squat barbell squats um, so that's what I mean about like reverse psychology where like I fixed my back from doing deadlifts but I did it very carefully and progressively with extremely good form and like step by step, kind of like dog training, just do the right stuff very carefully, step by step and slowly build consistency and persistence and that's how you do it. Very freaking similar with the body and um, fitness and strength and injury prevention and all of that. And that's sort of what I've been doing right up to... Um, now I am squatting decent weight. No, it's actually extremely. I'm not a strong. I'm not a super strong guy. My legs are quite strong. Um, I've worked out with like big ripped jacked guys at the gym that like bench press heavy weight, and you know big curls and bench press and like they can do chin ups like crazy and like they put a strap around their waist with. Um, extra weight and do weighted chin ups and stuff like that. Uh, my upper body strength is just absolute is ridiculous bad. <laughs> uh, my upper body strength is not great for my size and all of that. Um, that. That's what I'm working on now. Actually, I've been nerding out on fitness, um, and I'm doing. I've gone from sort of um, doing. Uh, like hypertrophy reps, so higher reps trying to grow muscle to strength training, which is lower reps, longer breaks between reps and sets, heavier weights. And, man, it, it makes a big difference. You get stronger so much faster um, than trying to keep the weights lighter and doing more reps. Hypertrophy versus strength training. Um But so I went from, because for a while I didn't know what to do with my knee. I didn't know what it was. I was getting all this contradictory stuff. Um, I didn't want to get cortisone injections if, that, if I didn't absolutely need it. Sometimes that can be really bad. Um, sometimes it works. Sometimes you get a cortisone shot so you don't feel the pain anymore and you go and snap something. Um, very, very common. Um that cortisone has a negative long-term effect. So I, I definitely didn't want to do that unless I, I wanted to leave that to a very, very last resort. Um, and if I could work out how to fix it without that, I wanted to, that's what I wanted to do. So um, yeah, then I worked out all the strength stuff. Uh, started with the body weight stuff. Short walks every single day, getting on my feet more. Now I'm doing weighted stuff. I'm still doing body weight stuff too. The body weight stuff's really handy because I can do it anywhere, anytime with no equipment. So that's been really freaking handy. And then when I'm at the place where my squat rack is and all of that, I, I rip into it, do some heavier stuff. Um, now I've built up the walking to the point where I'm doing 10K walks. 10 kilometer walks on the flat now and and I'm squatting reasonably heavy weight and and I'm feeling pretty good and and probably the next step from here is on my last hunt that I did on um it was sort of flat rolling stuff at the end and it pissed me off because I did one hunt a good a good solid day hunt where I didn't feel a single thing out of my knee and I thought sweet I'm coming right then I did another hunt nothing I'm like mint I'm out of the woods and then I did another hunt and right at the end of the last day I started to just feel it and I was like damn it um but that was almost before I got onto this that whole glute thing and the angle of the pull and all of that and since I worked that out <clears throat> I was like, okay, I've got to really get into some strength stuff here, and that's since then I've been doing the squats, um, and get and and 
getting real deep into the squat too and really targeting the glute. Um, there's other exercises you can do to target the glutes even more than a squat, um, but a squat gets the whole chain. Um, and actually uh, stiff-legged deadlifts are another one that gets the glute really good and that whole chain. Um, so that's what I'm doing. That's, that's where I'm at um, with the knee. I don't know if I'm out of the woods yet. I've been doing that quite a systematic, serious thing, working out every single day. Um, I've got myself to the point where I'm doing 10-kilometer walks on the flat with no pack. And my knee's sweet. I'm not feeling anything. Um so I'm hoping, and, and then with the with the strength stuff on top of that, <clears throat> um, and I'm doing upper body too to keep the balance in it, um, and I'm about to do some, some hunts over the next week or two, but I haven't given it a good test for quite a while, like a big climb, because it's coming downhill that was really screwing it up. So I haven't done a big climb, followed by a heap of downhill to really test it. But with that whole envelope thing, where <clears throat> you have that working range, and if you if you do less than that, you're going to start experiencing pain. If you start sitting around in your ass for days and days on end, you're going to like, oh, I've got a sore back. Because you're just screwing your body by just sitting around doing nothing. Like inactivity is, is just terrible for the body. Too much before you're ready for it is terrible for the body too. So um, I, I don't know how I'm going to go about it. I think what I'll do is I, I think I want to get another week or two under my belt of more squatting, um, more strength work. I want to get another couple of good 10k walks on the flat with no load, no pack on, um, <clears throat> just to stre- just to be sure, strengthen everything up. Um, I've got a couple of spots that I can do some pretty solid hunts on the flat, so I'll do that. Uh, do a good two or three days of that, and just mix a little bit of up and down, and I can do just enough to test it out. But I don't actually want to. The goal is is to not push it to the point where I'm at the end of the last day like, ah, nah, my knee's just starting to hurt coming down this last hill because that's sort of, you've pushed it to the point where you're, you're screwing it up again. So that whole envelope thing, I've got to Google that and um, let's see if I can pull it up right now. They use it in a lot of things. It's sort of like a scientific theory. Um Envelope of exercise summary uh, encouraging creativity envelope of function Can this do you a <laughs> um, yeah overload injuries explained envelope of function um, but once I found it and I started googling it I started finding people using that idea of this safe working range of motion and if you go under that, you're looking at creating issues. If you go way over it, you look, you're going to create issues too. You've got the safe working range and you sort of, you've got to spend more time at the top end of your working range is what starts to extend your safe working range out ahead of you and you've got to slowly build without injuring yourself in the meantime you know so that's what I'm saying really the goal here is to slowly do more and more without basically without experiencing pain if I push it to the point where I'm hurting my knee I've got to the point of detriment Um, I've got to try and do more and more without injuring it um 
the dental envelope of function, the envelope of function, musculoskeletal key. Yeah, here it is. Oh, that was actually it there. Yeah, that was... Dye's envelope of function. That might be the guy that invented it. Dye, D-Y-E. Dye coined the term envelope of function, a combination of magnitude and frequency of load causes loss of homeostasis. I don't even know what homeostasis means. Ha, huh, here we go. With respect to the knee, activity or injury pushes it out. Oh, ac activity or injury pushes it outside of its accept, acceptable EOF, which is the envelope of function. You get the idea anyway, and there's an actual graph of the envelope of function. You guys can Google this and nerd out on if you want to. And I've finished the dog training Q&A, and I'm just basically rambling here. Dye's envelope of function is a graph where there is load and frequency and there's a manageable level up to a point. Outside of that point is excessive and running the risk of injury. Um, yeah, so they're not actually talking about a bottom point outside of the envelope that's below the envelope, but that, that basic idea is if you spend too much time towards the bottom end of what you're capable of doing, you're actually lowering that top end of what you're capable of doing, you know. And, and the way I understand it, you basically need to spend as much time as possible to just under what is excessive, and that's how you build, you know. You can't just go from doing nothing to leaping way outside it. You just into yourself and do exactly what I've done, and now I'm stuck in this. It sucks, man. Um... Yeah, there's a real stuff up on my point, but um, it's also forced me to like do a big backtrack and uh, just work a whole bunch of stuff out. So, uh, sweet, that's us. Um, thanks to everybody who signed up to the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you can find us at biggameindicatingdogs.com. And you can follow us at Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And you can follow me at Paul John Michaels on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the next one.